board. Welcome everybody uh, to the Khabura. We are here for a new series uh, with our Rosh Pesnid Rosh, uh, Rabbi Joseph Dweck, on Harav Cook, a figure which, who played a very important role in not only 20th century Judaism, uh, but his influence is very palpable today as well. Uh, we're very honored to be able to host this series in partnership with uh, Mizrahi UK. Uh, a big shout out and thank you goes to uh, Rabbi Joel Kenigsberg, uh, as well as Rabbi Shaw, uh, for allowing us to partner up on this very, very exciting occasion. Uh, for those who are new to the Chabura, uh, we're a virtual and physical Beth Midrash uh, dedicated to uh, the classical Sephardi approach. We study the works of Sephardi and Ashkenazi HaChamim uh, who drank their waters from Torah Sephardi. And uh, we start a new membership program in July. Be honored to have you all check out the website, thehabura.com, um, to find out more. Uh, I also recommend everybody to please go on Mizrahi UK's YouTube page and subscribe. Some fantastic content on there. And we look forward to doing more events alongside the great team uh, at Mizrahi UK. So tonight's series, uh, we've got Rabbi Dweck back after a, a, a couple of months hiatus, I believe. It's a very busy long. schedule. It's been a couple of months, or so just over a month. Uh, but we're very glad to have you back, Rabbi, on, uh, as I said, uh, Haraf Cook, who a lot of us have heard a lot about, but actually haven't dug into the black and white of the text. So uh, I can see Freddie there smiling. So we're very excited to uh, um, dig into the wisdom of Rav Cook. Uh, Rabbi Dweck, thank you so much for being here. Uh, the stage is all yours. Bechavod. Thank you, Rav Sina. It's good to be back and see everyone. It's really good to see everyone. My goodness, welcome to the Shi'ur. Thank you for, for joining me tonight. I've missed you, and it's good to see some people that are new and have are trying this out the first time. <clears throat> um, so, um, this is a series on Rav Cook, and I'm doing this series as Rosh Bet Midrash, which might get me fired, <laughs> perhaps, because as you might have guessed, Rav Cook is not Sephardi. Uh, no, not at all. And yet, um, we've included him in the curriculum. And why, the reason why we've included him in the curriculum is because his thinking and his writing, uh, although perhaps not hand in glove fitting what we might consider the Andalusian approach to, uh, to Torah in general, and, you know, it is nonetheless, he could definitely hang in the Andalusia. He definitely belongs in that space. And, uh, and it would be interesting, actually, to be able to hear some of the discussions, uh, thoughts, and whatnot that might have, might have gone on between the thinkers and the hachamim of that space and, and Rav Kook. What we're going to find, I hope, is that Rav Kook, when I say he could hang with them, what that means is that Rav Kook uh, certainly draws a great deal from Harambam and his writing and his teaching. And... Uh, and builds that around his ministry. And when I say ministry, I use that in terms of his rabbinic responsibility, what he believed was his rabbinic responsibility. And Rav Cook, I'm not going to go through his biography. Rav Cook did live in London for a time um, and during World War I. And he, he ended up becoming the chief rabbi of what was then Palestine, a British mandate in Palestine. Um, and understood that the, the future of the Jewish state was in the hands of Kalal Israel, of the Jewish people, many of whom had no relationship or connection to Torah and mitzvot as we might understand it or recognize it. They were completely secular. And so Rav Kook needed to respond. He didn't need to, he felt the need to respond to the circumstance in which he found himself. And he was a profound Talmud Hacham. He was a very, very powerful Talmud Hacham and a very powerful thinker. But he also recognized that the times were changing and that the ways that his predecessors had dealt with things, had addressed things, were not necessarily going to work given the new paradigmatic shifts and circumstances that were occurring. And so Rav Cook knew that he was speaking to a new generation of people. 
I personally believe, this is my personal belief, that Rav Cook's words still resonate in a very cutting edge way, even in our days, because some of the things that he was brave enough to say, people today still are not brave enough to say. There is a passage, I don't have it for you here, but there was a passage in uh, this book called uh, Rabbeinu. And it's a book that was written by uh, a friend who served Hacham Ovadia for over 20 years as his scribe. What do you mean as a scribe? Hacham Ovadia wrote everything he ever wrote in his life by hand. And he had a person that sat with him, Eliyahu Shitrit, who took his writings and typed them and typeset them and put them into, prepared them for publishing. Uh, and after Hacham Avadia passed away, Eliyahu Shitrit, who spent every single day with Hacham Avadia for over 20 years by his side writing, wrote a book on some of his own journal entries that he had in his interactions with Hacham Avadia. And one of them was about Rav Kook, that somebody asked Hacham Avadia about Rav Kook. And not only did Hacham Avadia say that he was a tremendous Talir Hacham, which was evident by Rav Kook's writings, he said that he was treated horribly by some of the more right-wing, Hamo uh, says Haredim, but he says by the right-wing, uh, more right-wing uh, Orthodox Jews, they threw water on him, ridiculed him, treated him very poorly because of many of the things that he wrote and said that were not heard in that way by any of his predecessors. What I hope you will find, for those of you who are familiar with our teachings up to this point, and those of you who are not familiar, who will be able, to, I encourage you, to watch the teachings of the Chabura. If I haven't been here in a couple of months, it's only because we've had tremendous teachers teaching during this period of time. I'm, I'm so thrilled and proud of the classes that we've offered all of you uh, during this period of time. Listen to the recordings, listen to the YouTubes, the podcast, and here, so that you can sense, you will begin to sense that Rav Kook belongs with us in the Habura. His thinking, his approach, his way of teaching belongs here with us in the Habura. It will be different than perhaps what you might be used to hearing. Um, and, you, and I encourage you to be able to try and identify what the difference is. What might the disagreements be between him and Harambam per se, or even Hakam Sion Uziel, who was, who was Rishon Sion uh, after him, but, but uh, in connection with him. So we're going to have to, we're going to, have to look at that. You'll, you'll think about that. But without further ado, I'd like to get into the text. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the text on the screen so that you can follow along with me. But I'll also, we're going to do some reading here. All right. And, and another thing about Rav Cook is that because he wanted to use Hebrew, in his writings rather than Yiddish or anything else. And he wanted to use a modern thought with an old language. His language could be awkward sometimes. So it's not so easy to read through Rav Cook. So I'm gonna do the best that I can to help you with that. Um, but I'm also going to put a link in the chat uh, for, for where it is that we're reading if you wanna pull, pull it up on your own. So first I will provide you the link, which is on uh, the Hebrew, version of Wikitext. And that is here. Hopefully you all have it. And I'm going to share the screen and we're going to read this piece. Okay, I hope everybody can see it. This is a an essay that he calls Simaon Le'el Hai, which literally means a thirst for the living God. And he includes this in a series of essays that he puts together that he called zir'onim. Zir'onim means seedlings, right? These are plantings. He's planting these things. And these are essays that are dealing with what he believes issues that are bubbling up by, like I said, the shift of paradigm into the 20th century, into the new world into the high developments of enlightenment and how it is that these things are manifesting for us, the Jewish people. And, uh, and it's in this, in, in this essay, he talks about connecting to God and how it is that we need to do that. And I think before we get too far into it, you will see um, how he deals with this and why I think that he belongs with us here 
in our curriculum in the Hamura. So I'm going to begin reading. He opens Simon Le'el Hai. This is a, a thirst for the living God. And he says, E if Shah Limso Ma'amad Mebusas. Can we let these people in, please? Over here? Who are they? There's people in the waiting room. E if Shah Limso Ma'amad Mebusas La Ruach Kiim Ba'avir Ha'ilahi. He says, he starts quite abstract, which is something that an Andalusi uh, thinker may not like very much, but he starts abstract and he says that it is impossible to find a substantial standing for the ruach, for the soul, right? For the spirit, anywhere other than the environment of God, right? So if you try to find some soulless, some balance, some, some foundation for your soul without being in the space of God, it will not happen. He says things like knowledge, feelings, imagination, the movements of inner and outer things that connect to these elements of thought and feelings and imagination and, and, and the capacity of mind require for a person to be in a God space, whatever it is that that means. Then they will feel their, they will find their fullness. They'll find their equilibrium and they'll find their nahat ruah, right? Their calm of mind. And when he says that there's not like a, 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 there's not so much range for this. He says, if it is even slightly below this level of being in a space that is divine, if one doesn't reach the divine, but a bit lower than that, if that's what a person looks for, right? Let's leave God out of this, so to speak, a person says. That person's experience is stormy, like a, like a boat in a stormy sea. Right, so he's, he's thrown all over the place. Galim su'arim itnagdim waves that clash against each other hit and cause the person a tremendous amount of strife and and dis-ease. Yadrichu tamid menuha migal el gal yuta velo yadashelo. He will be thrown from wave to wave and not find himself, not find his place. If he finds himself able to anchor himself somehow in arrogance or in a, a callousness of feeling, right, as a defense, which means what? What is he saying? He's saying if because of a person's spiritual strife, their a lack of inner peace and balance, they end up trying to protect themselves with uh, callousness and a lack of sensitivity to feelings, a certain level of arrogance, right? A person ends up bringing oneself into numbing in some way. It'll help for a little bit to numb or to hold it back. It or hayav to 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 deal with the lack of light in his life for a period of time, to the point that he may even convince himself that he's found calm and rest in his life. But days will pass, not too long into the future. It will come back with a vengeance and it will toss him and push him with a lack of, of presence and stability. So again, very abstract ideas. 
but we can get from the 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 tamtzit, right the the uh, concentrated element of his words the following what is he saying he's saying that a person is uh, an entity that experiences complexities of mind and of feeling and that those elements find their home in the divine and that if a person does not reach the space of the divine it is forever stormy and unsettled it causes a person a tremendous amount of of instability okay it's essentially what Rav Kook is saying he says then in one line, Makom menuhatenu hurak be'elohim. The only place for our genuine rest and calm is in God. Right? Sounds very religious. Stay tuned. Then he says, but that's a big problem. Right? So I've said something, but the thing that I've said is absurd, really. It's nice for the rabbi to say, get to God. But then he points out that God is inaccessible. So he says, look, Elohim, but God is beyond all that exists. So it's not even appropriate to say that God exists because he doesn't exist the way that everything else exists. He is pre-existence. He's a precursor to existence. Right? I mean, I was known to say to my younger students all the time, God is existence. Why did I say that? Because I wanted to give them a sense of what, what we're talking about when we're talking about God. We're not talking about an object over here. The truth of the matter is that that was only a filler. That was a placeholder for what God really is, which is pre-existence. And so he says God is beyond existence. And so there's... Anything that we feel, think, see, experience... God is beyond. So we have no faculties. There are no tools with which to connect to God. He is utterly separate from us. Does this sound familiar? I leave it with you. I'm just asking you. Does this sound familiar from anything that we've ever taught in the Hamura? You have to think about it. But in any case, he says he's beyond any feelings. Bechol mashu lemala mikol regesh verayon banu. Anything that is beyond our feelings, our thoughts, our ideas, as far as we're concerned, is for all intents and purposes, nothing. I mean, what, we have no access whatsoever to it. And in nothingness, a mind and consciousness cannot settle no, I'm saying you can't settle your mind in nothingness. And God, for all intents and purposes for us, is nothing because we have no access to it because it's beyond anything that we possibly know, think, feel. Everybody with me? That shouldn't be new. That's old. Therefore, you find a horrible problem. And the problem is, is that we have people who want to reach God and can't. Because they re they realize there's this problem. Al kenim tiro al pirov. Usually it's with tamidah hachamim. I mean genuine ones who want the divine. Al kenim tiro al pirov tamidah hachamim mevakshe Elohim. These tamidah hachamim that that ask for God, they seek God. Yegeim va'yefim baruach. They are spiritually exhausted. Spiritually exhausted because they keep trying and trying and trying and looking and maybe this will do it, maybe this learning and maybe this person and maybe this music and maybe this book and maybe these ideas and it just never hits. When the soul yearns for the brightest light it's never satiated by little things like righteousness. Even the greatest deeds don't calm the soul. Because it's looking for the source of those 
of the purpose of those deeds. It's looking for the, the core, the fu fundamental elements. Even the light of truth in all of the elements that it studies is not enough to calm it. Beauty doesn't do it. Even the most exquisite artistry, the most exquisite visions it could come to pass, this is a very, very strong thing that he's saying, that a person who is searching for the brightest light and experiences the world in all of its broadness, in all of its expanse, in all of its diversity, in all of its physicality and spirituality, as simply not enough, as an empty pit. I'm reading the words to you. I'm not going to interpret them deeply. I want them to sit with you. This is new. So like I said, I, I, I'm, I'm going to pause here for a minute. I'm going to talk to you. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to bring back the screen in a second. Because my job is not just to read for you, but to bring you into this. So I met with a, a group of you uh, early on. Uh, and I told you, this wasn't a formal class, it was just a meeting. And so there are many of you who are not there, but I'm going to tell you what I said. And I said to you, be prepared to hear things and learn things that you don't know yet. And I don't just mean in terms of your knowledge, right? I don't mean in terms of data. I mean that there will be things that we may learn that are unfamiliar, that are new, that present things in a different way. And uh, Rav Cook may very well be that way because you can see already the way that, you know, even as I'm teaching, right? This is not my usual fodder, right? This is, these, aren't, these, aren't, these aren't the clean golden words of Harambam, right? These are not, these are not, uh, you know, parashat class, and where I'm giving you sources and going through them systematically. We're in his words now. And you can see that he's using Hebrew in a very interesting way because he's talking about very relevant, you know, modern ideas. He's using these old concepts and bringing them into modern dialogue. And he's talking about abstractions, but you can see that little by little, he's going to be bringing them down to earth into very practical terms. But the likelihood is that what he's saying now, you have a sense of what it is that he's talking about. If you've been on a spiritual quest in your life at all. And so I, my, my guidance for you here is, listen. Before you make your judgments and assumptions, listen to what Rav Cook is saying. Let it come in, let it rest. If you choose to reject it later, and I'm not, the only reason I'm saying that is not because I think everybody's going to, no, I'm saying this, if we were reading Kierkegaard, right, I would probably do, I'm saying, listen, let it come in, hear first what Rav Cook is trying to say. So this is your first exposure. You're going to have to hear it again. You're going to have to hear it again. And you're going to have to hear other things that he wrote to be able to get to know him, to see how he approaches things. But I believe that if you give him the chance, and again, this is my perspective, I believe if you give him the chance, you will find that he's a friend, that he is a member of the Bet Midrash. He's just in a different place, in a different time period of Jewish history, in a different space. Yeah. So let's go back to him. So what he's saying over here is that people human beings, because he believes that human beings are spiritual beings as much as we are physical beings, that our only place to find our, our place, our belonging, really, is in God. The problem is, is that we can't connect to God because of who God is. And so people who yearn to find divinity and things without, I'm going to say, without them even realizing that they are searching for the divine, so the way that he says it, he says, they look for the brightest light. 
And I certainly have known human beings who are searching for the divine without consciously being aware that they are searching for the divine. And when one searches for the divine, for the brightest light, there is no, no beauty, wisdom, or aspect of this world that suffices to fill that experience. And that is terribly frustrating. And that's where he is right now in his dialogue. Okay, so let's go back and see where he is. He says, The reality is, is that these people who are searching for the brightest light are searching for something that is beyond their power. It's not in their control to achieve. Because as far as they are, this entity that they are looking for doesn't exist. Why doesn't exist? As he says, I mean, we're looking for God. God is not found directly in human experience because God is utterly removed from all human experience and, and, uh, and environment. I mean, that which is, which is the yesh, cannot reach ayin. Ayin is nothingness, right? Not, not nothingness. Therefore, it causes fatigue and weakness. The desire to achieve becomes weaker. All of the strength of life, the, the intensity of life. That these people who are searching to God, for God, or searching for the divine, that is their inner drive. That's what they're looking for. So what he says is, there must be some conduit. Their their, their direct connection is not possible. So there must be some conduit between the God and the human and some element of space, pipeline, what have you, that allows for some kind of touching of sorts between the two entities and worlds. So he says, we have to show the way. How do you enter the palace? You enter the palace through the gates. Derech Hashar. What is what are what are the gates? Hashar hu ailahut hamitgale ba'olam. So he says the gates to God are the expressions of God in the world. Right? He says, the gateway to God, connecting to God, are through the expressions of God in his world. Ba'olam in the world. Now, before I read the rest of this, I'm going to prime it for you, right? Because when he's talking about the expressions of God, that's what he means over here, right? Asharhu, the gate is ha'elahut, the divine hamitgale that is revealed ba'olam in the world, Right? So he's saying that there is a way there is there that God expresses himself, so to speak, in his creation, like a work of art. So I've I've discussed this many times, so, but I know there are many new people here, so I'll say it again. It's like an artist. It's like an artist in an artist's work, in which if you, you look at the work of the artist, you get to know the work of the artist. Through the work, through the artistry itself, you get to know the artist. Whether that artist is an author, a painter, a musician, what have you. You get to know them through what they put out. Because what they put out are expressions of their very selves. So you can can look at a Monet, several Monets. And begin to get to know the man who painted it. Rav Cook is known to say, it was quoted in the JC when he lived in, in London at the time, that he used to go to the National Gallery very often. 
because Rembrandt was hanging, not the man, the portraits that he painted, the paintings, was hanging there. And he would go see it because he said that Rembrandt had this amazing capacity to express light in his paintings. As a matter of fact, Simon Shama wrote an entire book <laughs> about it. And he said, he's convinced that Rembrandt was a tzaddik. Rav Cook said that. Because it says that a tzaddik or zaru ala tzaddik, that light is planted for the tzaddik. And there is a light that is divine that a tzaddik sees. And he says he's convinced that Rembrandt saw that light in all things. And he was able to put it out in his paintings. That's a side point. But we know that when we read the works of, for, let's say, an author that we've never met, we begin to know that person through their expressions. So that is a very crude analogy for what we mean by God being expressed. God expresses himself, whatever it is that that means, in his creations. Harambam writes this very clearly in the Morene Bukhim. And he says that when Moshe Rabbeinu asked HaKadosh Baruch Hu, na dirachecha, show me your ways, ve'eda'acha and I will know you, which is what Moshe said, right? In the Pasuk, it's hodi'ayni na dirachecha, ve'eda'acha, show me your ways and I will know you. So Moshe tried to know God directly and that wasn't an option for him. When he said, hareni na kebodecha, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, lo yirani adam bahai. But you want to know my ways, which means my expressions, the, the mo manner in which I do, and through that, you'll know me, that I can do. And what was that, that God showed Moshe, which was his derachim? HaKadosh Baruch Hu responds to Moshe and says, Ani avir kol tuvi al panecha. For you, Moses, to answer that request, to show you all of my ways, I am going to bring all of my good before you. Kol tuvi. Haramban, in a brilliant uh, insight to that, says, what is kol tuvi? What is all my good that God is referring to? Haramban says that the kol tov of God is the entirety of creation. And how do we know that, says Haramban? Because it says, kol asherasa, God saw all that he did, vinet tov meod, and it was very good, kol tov. That's kol tovi. So Rambam says, what is the great expression of God's ways? And through those we know him, the entirety of his world. Back to Rav Kook. So Rav Kook says, oh, we've got somebody drawing on my page. So Rav Kook says, hashar hu ha'elahut ha'mitgaleh ba'olam, the gateway to knowing God, is the divine as revealed in the world. Ba'olam, in the world, bekol yofyo v'hadaro, with all of its beauty and splendor. Bekol ruach v'neshama, in every soul. Remember, every soul is a creation of God. Bekol hai v'remes, in every living creature and crawling thing. Bekol tzemach u'perach, in every plant, and flower. Bechol goyu mamlacha in every nation and government. That's very important because I always point out to people people don't mind so much studying God through nature. They don't like studying God through people. Because somehow flowers were created by God and they're beautiful, but people were created by God and they're problematic. And so what I always say is. Who created the people that wrote the things that they write? Wrote the plays that they wrote, the books that they wrote, the music that they wrote. wrote. Who created Beethoven, the Beatles? So Rav Cook says, you know, all of them, that's how you get to know God. Bayam Begalav, and then the seas and their waves in the expanse of the heavens, of the skies, and the luminary bodies in them. In the talents of all spoken word and rhetoric. 
ברעיונות כל סופר in the ideas of every author. בדמיונות כל משורר וביונות כל חושב in the ideas of every poet, the musings of every poet, and the output of every thinker. Every, he doesn't say some. Notice, he doesn't say ברעיונות כמה סופרים. בדמיונות כמה משוררים. Or he doesn't even say בדמיונות המשוררים הטובים, הצדיקים, לא זה. בדמיונות כל משורר, בהגיונות כל חושב, בהרגשת כל מרגיש in the feelings of everyone who feels. ובסערת גבורה של כל גיבור and in the storms of glory and might of every warrior. and hero. What Rav Kook is doing over here is calling our attention to the fact that the entirety of the world and all that is in it is an expression of God. And sometimes we like to compartmentalize those things. The things that we approve of that God made and the things that we don't approve of that God made. What I often say around this is that there are toxins in the world, yes. But even toxins must be studied so that we know what we are to keep away from and how they will affect us. The high divinity that we are thirsting, yearning to reach, even to be consumed within it, to be gathered into its light, We can't get to that level of our desire. And since we cannot get there, we can't reach that level from where we stand, it comes down to us, for us, into this world. And we find it and we, we rejoice and find the greatest pleasure and delight in the love of it. We find calm and we find peace in its resting place. And every now and then, we get this bolt of lightning that is beyond all thought, that shows us light. Who spoke about bolts of lightning? And suddenly the heavens open up and we see visions of the divine of God. Moments. Flashes before us. But we know that when we experience that, it's a temporary experience. The lightning goes away. We don't sit any longer in the inner sanctum, but rather in the courtyards of God in his palace. If you think that he's not throwing back all of this to Haramba, right? Think again. So he says, And when we search for that light and we, we access that light that we're looking for, not, and this is very important, not in the things themselves, But in what they express, and what rides within them, that we have no direct access to, but through them see, experience the divine that brought them into being, which is why at the very beginning he says, if all we're looking for is great literature, if all we're looking for to find is great art, if we're looking for great thought, if we're looking for all of it, it may help us for a moment, but we will be bereft. Unless we realize that these are things that are expressive of the divine, that these are writers, that these are interfaces. Have you guys heard my podcast with Donald Hoffman? 
Have you heard it? Have you heard it? Listen to it after this shiur. Because if you listen to him after this shiur, you will understand Rav Cook better. And if you understand Rav Cook, you'll understand Donald Hoffman better. And if you understand Donald Hoffman, you'll understand what Harambam means when he says, and the kol tov is the entirety of Maaseh Bereshit. And so he says that when we search for that light, when we're looking to gain that light, to achieve it, to connect to it, to grasp it, and we get to the highest levels of it, then we start to draw from the organuz. The organuz is the original light that Akadosh Baruch Hu created, but as Hachamim say, concealed for the tzaddikim. We talk to Hamid Galela Shakol Shoev or Makorayotel. And once we recognize that light, we can see it in all things almost. And if we don't see it in all things, there are some things that darken it within themselves to the degree that we realize that it's been put out over there. But you begin to detect God's presence or God's stamp, God's expression in all things. In all things. Yeah, but Sorry, I skipped. Excuse me. He says, when we look at these things isolated, look at these expressions as isolated things, this painting, that piece of art, that work, that thought, well, then they're like these little sparks for us that show us there's something there. Until we are able to begin to put things together and see a whole exciting, amazing, bright, divine world that runs all together as one. That you share this world, you as part of this world, not just as a spectator, but as one of the very elements of this world that he's talking about. You too are the beauty. And you experience it all as that. You see it, that they are really all connected through this one source. It is one expression. The universe and all that is in it is one expression of God. Within it exists all of the beauty, all of the light, all of the truth, and all of the good that one will ever find. It's in those things. It's in this world, this world, this life. All of the good all of the beauty, all of the light, all of the truth that you will ever find. And it's because it's been revealed through these things. Ah, you then see that these are expressions, these are revelations, these are the things that God put out as all the good, kol hatov. Ve'ashef ha'azorem b'chol hatov, and the outpouring of divinity that runs through, that flows, zorem, that flows through all of this good, ha'menaseh shorash ha'neshama l'inyonoto, is what lifts the soul towards its source and its heights. Which brings into check the physical world and all of its splendor. Because we begin to see the physical world and all of its splendor is precisely what they are. The interface. Or as Donald Hoffman calls it, the headset that we wear to engage in the virtual reality. But this outpouring of divinity through all these things is what is alive. One sees the world as alive, responsive, as though it has a soul as well. Not as though, as it does. And then all of a sudden, all of the creations, they wear this newness to you that you haven't been able to see before. It opens you to being able to see them through new eyes. 
וכל מראה של חיים מעורר ששון וישע. And all of that it is, all that it is that we see in life is awakened with joy and salvation. And all good things, good deeds, which, which elate the heart. And every learning that broadens our minds and expands our thought. Then the very confining elements of the purely physical aspects of these things do not any longer enclose the soul. It allows the soul to expand and open because the soul connects to what the soul is as, we, as it is the driving force in us and we are the, the interface, right? The body, the physical element is the interface, so too. The entire world. And there the soul connects to the soul that is in the world. sees that all of these little sparks that are detected in the life and the things that are in this world merge. We can see them. They connect and they become entwined, intertwined in what we call Tzror Hayim. Who said Tzror Hayim first? Avigail. Avigail, the wife of David Melech. Right? She was the wife of Naval, but thankfully she ended up becoming the wife of David Melech. And when she convinces David not to kill Naval because he will lose his connection to all of this by doing that, she says, then tihe nefshi, nefesh right aduni, surad b'tzror Hayim. Your soul will be bound up in the bindings of life. Whatever that is. Yeah, so that's what it is that Rav Cook is dealing with over here. So that's a taste. That's, that's your first taster of Rav Cook. And I leave it to you to consider whether he belongs or not and whether he should be part but as long as i'm around he's going to be part of the Havura because i think he has important things to teach in different ways than our other hachamim did but in nonetheless important ways that i think are quite connected to us right that are quite uh, relevant and familiar to us in our modern world and the way that we speak and think and so that's it. That's what I have for you. If we want some questions, I'm happy to answer. I don't know, Rav Sina, if we have some time for questions, I'm happy to answer some. I do indeed. Thank you very much, Rav. Um, I mean, all parts of that just sounded like word for word from the more, especially with regards to the It was definitely signaling lightning. the more. Definitely signaling. Yeah, indeed. Um, okay, who's got some questions, please? Uh, if you would like to leave them in the chat, or please feel free to unmute and ask the Rav. lot to digest. Let's see. Flora, you just mentioned Avigail. Don't you like the synchronicity of those things? And thank you for joining, Flora. It's good to see you. I have a question. Yeah. Um, do we see often Rav Kirk quoting Harambam? It happens a lot. Yep. Yeah. I mean, uh, Rav Kirk recognized Harambam as one of his cornerstones. But so many people do, so that's not necessarily a <laughs> not necessarily yeah. a, a card that allows them, you know, entry. I think it's a question of what it is that he does and how he draws from Haramba. But I think it's very important. You saw where he said at the end the Kol Hatov, right? Mm. And that he emphasizes Kol Hatov. That is without question in my mind a direct reference back to that portion of the More and what it is mm. he's talking about over here. But yeah. All oh, right, see you've got your hand up. Flora, you're muted. You're muted, Flora. Flora, you're muted. Flora, you're on. You have to unmute. <laughs> Let me see if I can unmute. I unmute. There we, oh, there we go. Ah, mute, unmute, you're muted again, Flora. Unmute. There we are. I'm muting. There we are. Now I hear you. What's your question? <laughs> my, que my question is how do we, rough cook is very esoteric and you know, it's brilliant, beautiful the way you explained it, Rabbi Dweck. But mm -hmm. I find it, you know, when the best was asked, you know, how can we cleave to Hashem when he's an all-consuming fire? So they say, cleave to the Rebbe. 
I mean, I know I'm saying something that's completely alien to our Sephardim, but I mean, does that not seem an easier way to get to Hashem, to cleave to his midot, to do what, you know, it's the way the rough cookers explain. It. I mean, you've explained it beautifully, but if I were to read that and I can read Hebrew, I wouldn't have got it the way you put it over. I find his writings very difficult to understand. I have tried right. to. Well, you can join the club, Flora, because so, as I mentioned at the very beginning, so many people find Rav Cook very difficult to read, right? So it, it's hard to, to always, uh, you know, find your anchor in his words. You have to get to know him. You have to get to read a lot of him and get to understand how it is that he uses them. Clinging to the Rebbe is dangerous. Exactly. Think, right? So, and that's not what Rav Cook is saying at all. Yeah. No, he's not. But he's saying that these, the entire world is the expression of God. Yeah. And that through that, we are able to find and connect him if we, if we, we, we desire that in the world. It's not an automatic, right? In other words, it's not, okay, connect to the world and you'll find God. It's not that. What Rav Kook is saying, you have, to, you have to be yearning for God. And the only way that you will reach any satisfaction in that is through the world that God created. It is absolutely possible to engage with the world and completely lose oneself in the world, as he says, right? It all depends on what is, what is the, the mode one is engaging uh, through. Yeah, how is it, what is it that a person's desire is? And he's bringing this out in a very broad way because the truth of the matter is, is that if we were to pull this apart and we were to write this out and start to unpack this essay, well, then of course there would be many issues that we have to caution against. Like I said, there are toxins in the world. And it's important for us to be able to know what is toxic and what isn't. Mm -hmm. And even to know how to deal with toxins. What way are they toxic? What will happen if we imbibe them and engage with them? That is also important. And it's also important to recognize that in these storms that he's talking about, right? He talks a lot, a lot here about storminess. Right? Yeah. In the storms that he's talking about, it's very possible to capsize or to lose or to be uh, you know, stuck for quite a time. And there's no question about the fact that there is risk in losing oneself in all of it. That is all very real and uh, present risk that one must caution against. But in the, the, the beauty uh, about a faithful search is without getting fatigued, or if a person genuinely does it in the way that Rav Cook is presenting over here, then as the Gemara says, as you know, right? One who comes to purify oneself, to come into purity, they are helped somehow, right? The world lifts them, brings them towards it. Things run in, in the ways that people search for. Challenges come their way that help them learn. Difficulties, hardships, teach lessons. So it's all about what is my purpose in my engaging with the world. Yeah? And that makes a big difference. Yes, there are a lot of questions you. there, Rav. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you, Flora. Yonatan Rahmani asks, in regard to Or Haganuz, if it is meant for the Sadiqim, how can the individual tap into it, especially if we are getting by barely able to have Kavana in the daily misfot, since we are most deaf, not like the Sadiqim? And so how does the average you touch into this? Is the Or Haganuz meant for the average member of B'nai Israel? That's a very good question. Yes, the question of organus, right? Or being able to see within the world, this light, right? For lack of a better term, is a question of how it is that I see the world. What, are, what is it, what is, again, it comes back to a question of purpose. What am I searching for? What are my, what are my goals in terms of living my life? If the, my goal in living my life is to know God, and my desires in order to be able to bring myself into that space, well, then it is the core goal of my life. And everything runs in that direction. And when everything runs in that direction, you begin to recognize, like Rav Cook is saying, light in things that you otherwise never would have recognized and noticed. And when I say light, obviously, I'm not talking about our crude, uh, you know, uh, light that we've got, this physical light that we've got. We're using it as an analogy because light is a carrier of information, isn't it? 
for us. That's what it is for us, for all intents and purposes. Mm. So I begin to see, I begin to see when I start to recognize that a world is, is unified, even through, even if you look at it through, through, through quantum physics, and you recognize that you basically can reduce everything down to basic elements. And those elements themselves are these basic particles. And we begin to see that there is unity in this universe. I begin to look at things differently. You begin to look at things differently. You're talking about kavanan tefillah. You're coming at it the wrong way. Kavanan tefillah is not how you determine that you are now ready to see the organus. To the contrary, kavanan tefillah has to be the only thing that matters to you. You realize that tefillah is your point of access to actually sharing space with God and connecting to God, talking to God. Why would that ever be something that you want to deal with rather than run after and search for? So yes, you say, look, I mean, we've got the sidur, which is a problem and uh, you know, everything is very formalized and so on and so forth. Okay, well, that's an issue that we have to deal with, but that shouldn't necessarily affect the fact that you want to connect to God. And that when you stand in God's presence, or when you at least put yourself in a place that is ready to stand in God's presence, that nothing should ever compromise that for you. What's more important than that? So you're worried about the repetition of words? If all it is is a repetition of words and you've got to recite rather than speak, then yes, it's always going to be a problem. It's a question of purpose. Look, look, look at the Rambam. Look, I mean, I have to pull it up for you because I wasn't ready to do this, but I'm going to answer your question, not just with this. You have to see that this is, it's not a question of, of actions. It's a question of what is it that's moving you? Why are you getting up in the morning? How important is it for you to be able to connect to the divine? And it's okay if you say, well, look, it's not that important. At least be honest with yourself and recognize that at this point in my life, it's not the greatest goal of my life. Okay, so then everything falls into place because you will be able to determine what the greatest goal of your life is by your actions. What is it that you're spending time doing? Are you spending time doing anything? Also a good question. So bear with me and I'll show you this. Here we go. Yeah, we were bound to bring in the Rambam, weren't we? Listen. Tzarich Adam, this is Rambam. A person must yechaven libo v'chol ma'asav, aim his heart and all his deeds. First, it's the aiming of the heart and all his deeds. Kulam, all of them, for one thing. Leda et Hashem baruchu v'lvad. To know God. And that's it. Ve'yeshibto v'kumo v'diburo His sitting, his standing, his speaking. Hakol. All of it. Le'umat ze'adavar. Le'umat means opposite this thing. That's literally what it means. So I have now positioned my life so that my direct opposite focus is entirely on knowing God. And what Rav Kook is saying, and Rambam definitely says this, what Rav Kook is saying is that when you approach the world that way, suddenly, you be, more than suddenly, you begin to see all things as expressions of that. And then what Rambam, I encourage you to continue reading. It's the third parak of Hilchot Deot. And what Rambam continues to do is tell you how your sleep is service of God, how sex is service of God, how exercise is service of God, how eating is service. You could proceed, go through all of it and show you this is all service of God. All depends what? What is your aim? And what is your purpose? And that changes everything. Thank so, yes, God. light is for a regular, what did you call it? Uh, what did you regular call it? Yid. Regular Yid. <laughs> Um, there's a, lots of fantastic questions here. Um, Freddie, do classical Sfardi Hachamim differentiate between Gashmiut and Rachaniut? 
to classical Sephardi Hachani, the French reading of Shemuel Rohani Yud. They talk about, of course, the difference between physical and spiritual things. They may use different terms for it, right? Harambam will talk about the sechel as opposed to the physical goof. Yeah, absolutely, all the time. There's yeah. another question here. Where does the Dara fit into all the good in the world to which Rav Cook refers? And what does the Rav say is its magnitude compared to all else? Wait, I need to read it with you because I'm not hearing completely. Who is this? This one's an anonymous, anonymous question ah, to direct okay. message to me. Where does the Torah fit into all the good in the world to which Rav Cook refers? And what does the Rav say is its magnitude compared to all else? Magnitude the Torah, the so it's asking, where's the Torah fit in all of that? Yes, into all the good in the world. The Torah, Torah is the framework. The Torah is the lens through which we see all of it. It creates our capacity for, for understanding it all. It's the framework. Does that make sense? It's, it's, that's it. That's what the Torah is. That's why the Torah is called the Keli Hemda. It is a vessel. It is a desirable vessel. And that's what it is there for. There's a comment by Yoshua if you want to read Rob there. Um, Rob, Rob Shere, Rob Shere, and and I want to echo these questions. What is the question? What is the question? I think it's referring uh, to... Notably, Rob Cook does not mention in this piece the Torah as a means of one soul finding Menuha with God. Correct. It was mentioned somewhere else in his writings or is his point specifically if soul cannot find Menuha and God be a Torah study. He's not saying that you cannot find it through Torah study because Torah, of course, also is an expression of God. It's part of this world. And I'm saying that it's beyond that, that the Torah provides a framework of thought. It gives you the lens, right? It talks about what the nature of the endeavor itself. But one cannot divorce oneself from the world and pretend that it's not there, or as I like to say, it's an elaborate distraction rather than an elaborate expression, uh, and connect. One will always be at a loss as a result of that. Yeah. What I else think we that's all the questions there. Anybody else? Any other questions? Or No, that's it. Rav? Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure. So uh, good to see everyone. Really welcome. So good to see everyone present. Yes. Lots okay, of bye. old faces, lots of new faces. Very happy to have everyone here. Um, looking forward to seeing you all on Sunday, for part two of our Sunday special. Uh, as you know, we alternate between Tuesdays and Wednesdays, but uh, commemorating our one year anniversary. Um, we had part one on Bale Atta Safot last Sunday with Rafael Rappaport. This Sunday, we have Rabbi Aaron Haleva um, enlightening us on Hachmet Safarad and their approach to Talmud. So please do join us Sunday night. Um, and then I believe next week we have um, senior Rabbi uh, Eli Abadi, who's the Abed Din of Arabia, um, and the senior Rabbi of the UAE. He'll be giving a, a shiur to us, I believe, on Wednesday night. And then we will then have Rabbi Dweck back for our final shiur of our pre-membership mode on the 29th of June. Um, and then, please God, from July 5th, we begin the membership mode in conjunction with Dangura Education and, of course, Montefiore Endowment, um, without whom none of it would be possible. So please do check out Bahabura.com, um, Mizrahi.org.uk. And again, a big thank you to Rabbi Joel Kenigsberg and Rabbi Shaw uh, for opening the tent. And we look forward to welcoming you all for the next episode of the Chabura. Thank you all, Rabbi. Good night. Have a safe flight tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, off to New York. And uh, thank you, everybody. See you all Sunday night.